Hi, everybody. Welcome to this fascinating conversation um, about trade showrooms, behind the doors of trade showrooms. I am here, Jane Dagme, Editor-in-Chief of Designer Today magazine, and I am joined by three incredible panelists who I'm going to introduce in a moment. First, I want to also thank Aspire Design and Home magazine for asking me to moderate this. Um, it's, it's a subject that I'm really interested in. It's a subject that we cover in our magazine and um, it's very worthwhile. And I also want to say that um, this is part of Aspire Design Tour, what they normally would do actually a physical tour. But because of our limitations today, we're here doing a virtual uh, panel discussion in a virtual showroom. So, okay, now I'm going to, um, actually I forgot to mute my, my email, haha. <laughs> well, oh, <laughs> I'll try and do that later. But I'm gonna introduce you all. So, um, Jeannie Chung um, studied fashion, and I'm reading from my notes because I do not memorize very well. <laughs> <laughs> Chung studied fashion before design. And though there's no denying her personal style, the latter stuck for the long haul. Her commitment to interior design and the trade continues to grow. Jeannie opened her retail shop, Cozy Stylist Chic, in Pasadena in 2016. When she saw that a lot of designers were gravitating to the store, she pivoted to accommodate them and devised her first trade program. And she continues to refine and grow it ever since. Jeannie collaborates regularly with the High Point Market Authority, and she serves on the advisory board of the Design Influencers Conference. So glad you could be here, Jeannie. Okay. So excited Next, to be here. Um, Thanks. Alexis Barbera with Schwartz Design Showroom. She's the CEO and owner of Schwartz Design Showroom, located in Metuchen, New Jersey, and Stamford, Connecticut. Also, um, she's born into the furniture business. Her grandfather, Morris Schwartz, opened Schwartz Furniture 70 years ago in New Jersey. Alexis returned to her roots after a high-profile career with Bobby Brown Cosmetics and has grown the business to two locations. It was originally only in New Jersey. Um, mm -hmm. Barbero credits transparency and customer service as cornerstones of the brand's success. And the showroom is trade only. And last Thank but not least, Melissa Fenigstein from uh, Final Touch Trade Only Showroom. Melissa was born into the home furnishings industry as well. Her father was a furniture manufacturer and she was a teenager when she made her first pilgrimage to High Point Market. Melissa made the shift from wholesale furniture sales to interior design in 1998. And at that time, there were no multi-line showrooms in Long Island, so in September of 2000, she opened Final Touch Trade Only Showroom. Five years ago, she moved the business to Syosset, and she has just gone through her third expansion. So welcome. Let's get going. Thank you. Let's get Thanks. in it. My first question is, how is business today? How, since we all have been sheltering in place, I want to find out what's going on. How are you doing? So I'm going to start with Alexis. So I think we've all turned on a dime and pivoted. Um, we've been closed in both locations since March 19th, it is, which was a Thursday. Um, and, you know, thankfully, we have two great teams who have had wonderful relationships, and we've been able to sustain our lines of communication and really um, run our business remotely um, in terms of reaching out to our designers, uh, processing orders, quoting, um, and moving into that virtual world. Um, and we're maintaining. I mean, I'm really grateful. I think it's, it's a testament to my teams and how incredible they are and how they have, you know, brought in their approach and pivoted as well and reaching out and making sure that we're creating the touch points that we need to, to make sure that our clients are good and are okay and that they're able to service their clients. For sure, it's, um, it's a different world. It's a different world. Yep. Um, Jeannie, are you finding uh, with what's happening with business, are you held up in any supply chain issues or is it pretty smooth for you? 
Uh, no, it has been tricky. It has been tricky because there are so many uh, factories that are closed right now. So we're finding that there, there needs to be that extra layer of communication where we're constantly calling, checking up. Are you open? When do you expect to open? Um, you know, what's going to happen if we pay for this uh, is, and we send the purchase order through, is it going to be on the top of the pile so that when you do open, it's going to be first in line or is, will the, will there be an extra delay um, once the factory is open? So um, it's taken two, three times the time to really process those orders and um, figure out um, what can be shipped and what can't be shipped and, you know, how to move forward. But designers are, you're busy with designer phone calls and yes, they, they want are, to place. Uh, there's no there. doubt that it has slowed down just because there have been so many projects that have been, that have been put on hold, mm -hmm. but people are still, still inquiring. And I know that um, a week and a half ago, we just received a large influx of orders. So mm -hmm. as uh, some of the states are loosening things up and opening, um, opening up again, they're pulling those orders through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, but the, the lead times are a bit longer than the normal. So. I, I think there's a general sort of commitment that everybody in this industry, hopefully, and, and your clients and those clients are understanding that, that bit of, you know, that longer lead time. Yeah. Tell me, Melissa, yes. for you, um, I, I'm not sure how many people work in your showroom, but um, do you have, are you getting enough interest in orders to keep it open and you know have you sustain your staff and the showroom itself is the showroom itself is closed right. um i'm here today by myself um as far as for about a month everybody was working from home uh we changed that recently about 10 days ago and uh, a few people i i put on furlough um, just because the, the hours of work aren't there to keep the quoting going. Um, I am seeing more activity though with the announcements that the factories are coming back online, even if they're only operating at 50%, um, mm -hmm. all of a sudden orders are starting to come through. Um, so I'm hoping that the closing, the ban and the pause of New York, I think they called it New York pause. I'm hoping mm -hmm. that that will be lifted and we can all go back to work. I mean, we have things set in place to do so, and really we are looking forward to it. Yes. I think too that, um, you know, everyone is sitting and they're looking at their homes and they're reevaluating and seeing how much value their homes are. I mean, I've spoken to designers who are like, my clients have called me and said, oh, I've been sitting in this horrible sectional and why didn't I do it? And first thing that we do is we're gonna get a new sectional, we're gonna paint, we're gonna do the wallpaper. So I think that there is such a renewed focus on family and home and, you know, to Melissa's point, things have slowed down, but there certainly is interest there. And then to Jeannie's point, um, with all of the, the different manufacturers coming online and your, your point about just over communicating, we've been sending out weekly updates based on our vendors. Um, I, as I'm like talking on this panel, I'm getting uh, text messages they are cogging. They're open as of Monday. Mm -hmm. you know, so like with every email, it's like, oh, we have one more that's coming online. Yep. So every week we send out a status. And with those statuses, our designers can then go to their clients and speak, you know, in a way that their clients can understand, that their customers can understand in and terms of lead time. Exactly. Exactly. I'm glad. Um, one thing I want to mention, but I, then I want to go into talking about over communicating at this time and the importance of that. But um, for anybody watching, please, you can submit questions and uh, questions for us and we'll try and get to them all. So just hit the Q&A box. Um, I want to talk about over communicating. So email is one way that you are communicating. What are some other uh, ways that you're making sure has your social media changed at all? Um, have, are you making personal calls? How in different ways, Jeannie, I'll start with you. How are you reaching all out? Of, to all of the above. I know that people have messaged me as well via social media. And then I, I'll direct that information over to Ray who takes care of all, all of the, um, all of the paperwork, the quotes, the proposals and all that. So um, yeah, we're, you know, phone calls, phone calls, emails, everything. 
Yeah. Yeah. And a, a lot of assurance that, yes. that the designers, they're, they're, you know, that they're not going to lose money or they're not going to, you know, that there's Absolutely. just. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're doing, and, we're dropping off samples. We're mail, you know, we're doing home drop offs. We're dropping off things to their clients. We are smoke signaling if we can text message in like to Jeannie's point, it's all of the above. Mm -hmm. um, I actually you know, cooked a meal with one of the designers that we service. <laughs> um, we, we, <laughs> um, we did a FaceTime call and I put it right next to my um, cooktop and he was cooking and I was cooking and we spoke about business and mm -hmm. also got to know each other personally in a different way. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed that part of this. Um, well, they become we did, friends, right? Yeah, they absolutely. become friends. <laughs> You're talking about your designer clients and I would assume also some of your vendors, but you're talking about designers. Mm -hmm. Right now yes. I'm speaking about a designer. Yeah. We, yeah. we cooked a meal together. Yeah. I think it's all about supporting each other. So we're creating what we do in our showrooms physically when we're creating that community. We're now working as hard to make sure that they feel supported and communicated with. And I mean, I had a call with a designer whom I actually hadn't spoken to almost a, over a year. And she was like, I just, I, it's so good to hear your voice. And I think too, to the point of over communicating, a lot of times we forget to just pick up the phone and call and, mm -hmm. you know, we're emailing, we're texting, we're DMing. And sometimes just hearing somebody's voice is so reassuring and, you know, and it's just nice, you know, you feel like you feel the support when you can really um, hear or visually see over Zoom as well. Yeah, we're, we're doing a lot of that too, FaceTiming and Zooming with our clients too. Mm -hmm. We made a huge effort to call everybody just because I think, especially mm -hmm. early on in the, in the shutdown, it was really important to hear voices as opposed to just another email um, because we got all bombarded with uh, mm -hmm. uh, tons of communication in the, in the written form. And it was, you need to speak to people. There's comfort in that. Right. Absolutely. Right. Mm -hmm. so, um, I want to talk about how it works with trade showrooms and um, and it's a mathematical question and I'm not really that great at math, but what I do know is because I listen to, of course, I listen to a lot of different um, things out there um, and about issues in the industry. So designers want things quickly, 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 right? And so sometimes they might think, oh, what, why should I go through a trade showroom? That's just one more person between me and, and who I want to go to. So tell me what, I want to know, what is your value? Why do people, you're all successful, you're all expanding and that's great news. What is your value? What keeps people coming back to you? And with that, let's talk about the math. Why is it practical? a practical business move to work with a trade showroom. So Melissa, I'm going to start with you. And okay. um, what's what keeps people walking through your door over and over again? Well, we always try to have new products um, and educate them on what's being um, brought to the industry at all of the different um, wholesale trade shows around the country for um, most importantly, High Point. But we go to all of the shows um, we travel several times a year looking for both new vendors, new products. Um, we do a tremendous amount of research and then do programs within the showroom to share that all. You know, I do every market. I do um, a slideshow. We've gotten the last one I did in October, 94 people. Um, wow. That, I wonder if that's going to change going in forward. Person? Um, <laughs> 94 people um, come and it was a basically a two hour program with lunch and it was a whole slideshow that was um, compiled from photographs that I took and some of my staff took while we were at market. Um, and it, I would uh, like to just ask you something because when I, when I look at you and when I, I live in High Point now, so when I'm in the middle of a market, I'm always thinking everybody's here, but are, are you working, the designers that you're working with, do most of them not come to High Point or not go to Atlanta? I think a lot of designers, I think it's become more common that people go. Um, mm -hmm. But number one, it's tremendous. It's, a thir it's 13 million square feet, I believe, is the, is the current number. Um, you can cover it all. And when yeah. you're new to going to market, you don't know how to focus geographically. 
um, your trip and you don't get to see a lot because you get lost. So even the most seasoned shopper in High Point can't cover everything. Uh, so right. that helps. And even if they go, say they go once every two years, they don't go once every six months. And that makes a difference in staying connected mm -hmm. with the industry. They rely on you to your curation, your eye, your knowledge and experience to get around. Yeah, and, and it's you're, exciting. You're absolutely I, right. I find my point refreshing. And I think when that's given to the trade, they also feel refreshed in their creativity and, and excited to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think, I mean, I don't know if it's my turn, but for yeah. us, the number one thing um, that keeps our clients coming is our service. It comes down to relationships, and I equate it to designers as they build and have their relationships flourish with their clients. Um, the level of service that we provide for our designers um, keeps them coming back. Um, I always said, we were talking earlier a little bit about pricing, and um, price is always a parameter and something obviously that you're working within, but um, I always like to have them know exactly what type of service that they're getting, what the difference is, um, why it is worth working with the trade trail room. And then there are sometimes when it's not. Mm -hmm. um, and there is like, I always, when I'm talking to a new potential new client, um, it has to work for them and it has to work for us. We need to have this symbiotic relationship that we work together, we partner together. Uh, we have a vested interest in helping them to build their business. And they feel likewise about our showroom. Um, you know, talking about spending the amount of time researching, we shop jobs, we are picking fabrics. You know, I've had people send me on a text message on a napkin. What do you think? You know, here's the room parameters. Do you think we could fit a sectional in? Um, you know, helping them with CADs, helping them with drawing. Uh, you know, we're there to make them feel more secure and to make them feel better in their presentation and their service to their clients. We are there for support. Is it normal to provide CAD services to help? I mean, is that that's a service that you can provide for your, for your clients, Alexis? Help them so visualize we, uh, something? Yeah, um, I mean, I, we've also done, I said it's like kindergarten. When we sit there and when you're working with wedge sectionals and we're sitting cutting out, you know, paper and we're taping it onto and for those of my team members who are on this call they're all laughing right now because I literally I'm like let's take it back to kindergarten um but sometimes you have to do that but yes so we can pop something into CAD it's um it's something that we love to be able to do typically um I like to work with some of my my staff who offer that service in addition um, and then they work with designers directly. It's also a service that we can provide for them. Um, but like for right now, since we're all trying to go above and beyond and think out of the box, it's certainly something that we are happy to do and happy to work with them on. No, we've definitely done that with designers before because not everybody there has the ability to plot something, you know, plop something into a room to scale. But, you know, when they can see it to scale, either 3D or 2D, uh, it gives them that extra reassurance that, yes, this is okay. And they're more, they're more willing to pull the trigger that way. Absolutely. So. But that's something that, you know, and I, I always try to mentor designers and, um, you know, teach them, train them that, you know, these skills are super, super important to have those skills to be able to convey to your clients um, what you're envisioning. Um, that will make their job a lot easier as well. Mm -hmm. So I think as trade showrooms, we're also in, in speaking with designers, we're speaking about professionals in all different levels um, mm -hmm. and experience. And yeah. it is, I think, partly our responsibility to make sure to cultivate the relationship um, and help ensure that they don't make mistakes in their ordering. Um, mm -hmm. You know, in ordering, using a sectional, somebody said that a moment ago, you know, the right mm -hmm. facing or the left facing. Yep. <laughs> um, and understanding the different pieces, there are different styles of wedge, meaning a 90 degree corner or a rounded curve, all of these things. And just making sure that no mistakes, mm -hmm. that it delivers I'm, clean. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm, That's a great I, I'm, point, Melissa. 
I would because like oftentimes those orders come in and we catch them on this end. Are you sure mm -hmm. this is really what you wanted to order? Because this does not make sense. When a factory will come to me with a question um, when they receive an order, and, you know, looking to clarify information and they apologize for asking the question sometimes, I said, please don't apologize. Any mm -hmm. level that the factory gives me, I then am going that extra mile for the designer that I'm serving. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. questions are great. I, mean, I think that's a great point too. Oops, sorry, Jane. No, I was just going to say preventing costly mistakes, helping designers yeah. prevent costly mm -hmm. mistakes is like yeah. a big, a big value. It's huge because one mistake can erode a lot of margin and across, mm -hmm. you know, how many different orders, you know, it, it just all depends. But a lot of our clients too are single operators and don't have that team support behind them. You know, some have assistants and some have staff, but we are really their extended staff. So not only are we working with them when they come in with their clients into the showroom, you know, so we're a part of that project from the beginning, but in terms of mistakes, you know, I, I know every showroom works a little differently, but we all have how many different points that somebody is looking from that quote to that sales order that gets written up to the purchase order that goes to the vendor, to the acknowledgement coming in, to having somebody check that acknowledgement against the purchase order. So there's at least four to five different points um, in our process where that order is being checked and made mm -hmm. sure that everything is perfect. And then at the end of the day, as we all know, because it's so detailed, things do happen. There are sectionals that <laughs> still come in wrong. Oh my God, I did it the wrong way. The phone calls, the text, and you know, and we're the ones who are at the end of the day are saying, don't worry, bring it. I'm going to put it on the floor. I'm going to sell it for you. I'm going to partner with you. I'm going to sell you the right one at cost. I'm going to make sure that you're whole, that you're okay. Your client's going to be fine. You can promise them we're going to push it through. So, you know, wow. having those relationships with the vendors mm -hmm. and saying to them, we got you. We've got mm -hmm. your back. That is the biggest support we can provide for sure. And that, you know, it's nice when the vendors give us that kind of support also so that, you know, it, it, it doesn't feel good to anyone to have a problem from the end user to the designer, to the trade mm -hmm. showroom, to the manufacturer, to the trucking company, it's, it doesn't feel good. So you look to make it um, a quick recovery for everybody. For sure. Well, if you're important mm -hmm. sure. to that vendor, they will go that extra mile for you, right? Mm -hmm. They will. Absolutely. And you know, if not, we, we have the bill. I would rather either um, you know, lose money, break even on a sale and have it right for the designer than to have the designer eat that. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's what they don't realize until they try doing it on their own. They, those mistakes happen to them and then they realize the value. Mm -hmm. of, of the, right, the relationships that we have so okay mistakes one thing and that like I, i'm like scared i'm not even a designer but just hearing <laughs> you talk about it, i'm like oh my god <laughs> let me tell you i did and i think this scared me from being a designer i did a window treatment project once for somebody in a new york high rise and i never measured the elevator but her windows were enormously wide and at the time that the installation was happening i was like am i gonna have to pay for like a a lift up to the 23rd mm -hmm. floor. I mm -hmm. I've done it. I feel it. <laughs> I feel it. But tell me, with, and I never did design again. So, um, but with with without the mistake issue, Jeannie, the um, in, in working with you, I'm a designer. I want to work with you. Mm -hmm. Can I make? Can I still mark up product and and make something on that? You know, even though I'm buying it through you, is there still no, room absolutely. For Absolutely. And I know that on this end as well, you know, if, if it's something that isn't a custom piece and it is available online, although I really do prefer to, you know, go towards customization just because the, the designer can't be shopped that way. But in the event that that does happen, we do price check online to see what's available mm -hmm. and um, to the public. And if it's something that we find that is below uh, IMAP pricing, we will let the vendor know, number one. And number two, we'll, you know, we'll let the designer know as well. So we, we want them to be able to make money. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you sell yeah. off? Do you sell off the floor too at your respective showrooms, Jeannie? Do you sell? We we sell off the floor, yes. But um, surprisingly, more people are doing custom. So they see that they look at it for quality, um, quality style, and then they'll do their own COM or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think we we're talking about having a showroom. Um, I try to always have a piece of each of our main manufacturing partners on the floor at all times, so the clients can see, touch, feel. Um, again, between the experience of all of our team members, you know, we're very confident in letting the designer and their client know and understand how pitch and scale and mm -hmm. speed height and all of these different measurements really come together to create the experience of sitting in something or touching or feeling something. Um, I know in our showroom, I'm constantly rotating things in and out. And I always love to, when I sell something off the showroom floor, I want the designers to make money. We'll just, most times, mark it down to cost, sometimes cost. Again, some of my, my team members yell at me. They're like, stop giving it away, stop. <laughs> no, but it, we just want to make sure also it's so important to constantly have things being fresh and new. Melissa, you probably know, I mean, you, you've been in the business a long time, but I remember when I first started working for my mother, we would go to High Point, she only went once a year. And, you know, we would buy, you know, maybe once or twice a year and we would move the floor around, you know, and it would be a big production. You know, now we are constantly in a, such a fluid motion of bringing in newness, changing the floor. I mean, it, it's a constant, I could be wearing stilettos and be hoisting up, you know, uh, dining chairs. So, you know, having that, it's also part of the service we're providing. You know, we're constantly having things that are new and investing in our floor mm -hmm. so that they can feel inspired and so that their clients can also be inspired and see, oh, you can have this for this, but look what you can do now. Mm -hmm. Look at how we can take, oh, I know what I like, but, you know, the designer can bring it to this vision and then they can help with their team to even bring it to a next level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, keeping the floor fresh is important, and, but new things are always coming in and out. And I think if you are selling something off the floor to make um, room for new and fresh, I think it's, I think you're doing the right thing, Alexis. I, I have no yeah. problem letting it go even sometimes less than cost yeah. just to make room for the new. And I'm happy yeah. to see it go to a designer where they can make money and mm -hmm. see somebody really enjoy something. Do you, like, again, it's with the purpose of making room for new and fresh. Do you have periods where you do a massive floor redo and you do like a sale to designers um, where you are selling off a lot of samples at a time? We try and start that process um, right before markets, you know, like usually at the end of the summer into September to prepare for October market and start to make room and the same thing in the spring. Um, mm -hmm. Does it always work? No. Do we get overcrowded? <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then I end up sitting on merchandise in the warehouse um, for a little bit to make room for something just so that it doesn't get ridiculously overcrowded. But um, we also do a lot of, um, you know, I don't know what happens in the other showrooms, but we have a lot of, you know, paintings like behind me um, that are available for the designers to take right out of the showroom. So in order to keep those fresh, we cycle those in and out of a storage unit to make sure that it stays current. Do you also, um, do designers still, are they allowed to take things out on consignment? And in these days though, I'm just curious, now with sort of germaphobe everywhere, mm -hmm. what will that look like? I mean, will that have to change or will you get, the, you know, how will that happen? I don't think with um, accessories and art and accent furnishings, it, it has to go into the spaces. That's part of it. Um, yeah. just, the delivery guys are going to have to be conscious of, um, gloves, masks, you know, all those kind of things until it is safe for the public to go back to how it was. Um, but yes, I think the interiors business requires that. I also think too, um, and I've, I've said, I've had this conversation even before this pandemic, you know, there are some clients who say, well, I, you know, I don't want something used. Yeah. Not and I'm always saying, listen, this is where we're also different from a retail store. We're, we're trade showrooms. So we have a very, you know, the, the amount of traffic that we have coming through our showrooms, albeit you hope it's, it's busy, 
it certainly is not a retail store where people are coming in and kids are jumping on pieces and, you know, there's schmutz everywhere. You know, it's, it's a controlled environment, um, which again is, is going to be an advantage again for us as we look to reopen and to transition to our next stage because we can be controlled um, and put things into place that take our employee safety number one, making sure that they feel safe and secure, um, and then to bring in our clients as well. But we, we do the whole on approval. I always say like, if I can wrap it and fit it in your car, you can take it. So mm -hmm. that goes for end tables, chandeliers. That's we'll a great do it. thing too. Cause you know, you don't, uh, when, when you're dealing directly, you don't have that luxury of mm -hmm. just send it to me, just ship it to me. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, and then maybe I'll keep it. Um, so I want to talk about, of course, now you're all getting ready to reopen, hopefully, and it'll look a little bit different, but the showroom experience, what, what it's been for you and Jeannie, I'm going to start with you because you are <laughs> sitting, I have seen, I have seen schematics of the, this space. Mm -hmm. You, you have big plans. You are like, you know, your space is increasing incredibly. Tell us about what your vision is for your showroom. Well, you know, right now there are a lot of um, big showrooms that are closing. Um, you know, I've had this in, in the works for quite a while. And to me, it's always been about experience. You want an experience to bring people in to, you know, touch and feel. And um, it, to me, it's not just about furnishings. It's about everything. Um, what we're doing here is we're partnering with um, Monogram Appliances. They're putting in their LA Experience Center in the back here um, yeah. and you know we host a lot of events mixers um, CEUs and things like that um, here I want to really create um, you know and nurture a design community and that's something that's been lacking in our area um, it exists I would say it exists um, on on the west side of LA here it's getting there um, and and I think that people are understanding the value of networking um, so and and it's about collaboration not competition you know even with um, the appliances being in the back um, I you know we were approached and said do you want to sell the appliances and to me I thought it would be in our best interest to partner with appliance showrooms rather than be their competition so this way we can send business back and forth My, our forte is the furnishings and we want to keep it that way um uh we're bringing in um acoustical pods for designers so we're putting in co-working space as well for interior designers and we're bringing in uh the acoustical pods so they can bring their clients in have their meetings have all those the the samples the different finished samples together um, so that when they meet with their clients they have their tray of fabrics, finishes, and pictures and everything. And if their client doesn't like it, they can just pull something else. Everything is there for them. Mm -hmm. So Tell, we, want, I, it I be, want, we I, want it to be a turnkey experience for them. <laughs> I want to ask you a question that might have popped, it popped into my mind. Um, okay. So you were oh, oh, an LA, Monogram's LA Experience Center. Mm -hmm. So just, I mean, that's, that's amazing. But mm -hmm. how do you get to that point as, as, as a person that can, that monogram says, Jeannie, I'd love to partner. What's the relationship building that happened there? Just. Oh gosh. Um, you know, I've been working with monogram for probably the past five, six years. And, you know, I travel a lot, you know, that <laughs> you see me everywhere. High point, um, uh, K biz, New York, you know, ICFF, wherever I'm, I, yeah. And you know, those, those relations develop develop over time um and some people may know that i have been blogging for the past seven years yes. and that has really opened up a lot of doors because i've been sent to um you know, I'm approached by PR people, uh, come, you know, come to Europe, come see our show and present all the new trends. And because of that, uh, you know, I'm bringing fresh and new mm -hmm. uh, things that uh, designers here haven't seen before. And um, so they want to be around that. They want, they want that energy. Um, they want to learn from that. 
Yeah, no, I just, you know, it's that, that relationship building and it's your hard work and you're put in the time <laughs> Well, and it, yeah, it is, it is a lot of hard work. People think, oh yeah, it's fun. It's traveling. It's not. It's really putting your heart into it and really, you know, taking that effort. You know, some people may see it. Oh, wow. It's a free trip. Mm -hmm. No, it's work. You're going to, you know, you're going to represent, uh, you know, you know, what you've been brought here for, you know, in a really good light. And because of that, you know, people want to work with you time and time again. Um, exactly. Thank you. I want to, um, so experience, Alexis, I want to talk to you, but before you tell us about what it's like to work with you, I want to say that somebody, Sue Keenan wrote in and she said, as a vendor to Schwartz, I can say that they make it fun for the designers to work in their showroom. So. Aww. Thank you, Sue. <laughs> what makes it fun? What makes Sue is Philip Jeffries, the, mo the most amazing wall covering company out there. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sue. So what's it like? Is it champagne all day or what's going on there? Oh, it's champagne, butterflies, and giggles all the time. I mean, when it's not, you know, breakdown time. No, um, we, I like to think ex it's the same way, experience. Um, I think in terms of what are my clients going to need, in Connecticut, it's a little different. Our setup is a little different than in New Jersey. In Connecticut, uh, we're so lucky we're part of a design community. So I'm in the same building as J.D. Starin Carpets, which make incredible broadloom and rugs, and uh, Dadar Fabrics is upstairs, and Kravitz. So we, there's, you know, there is that experience of having a real physical community where the designers can come into. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of in the showroom as well, I, I think it's also very important for me to... Uh, we we're talking about like mixes on terms of like at the manufacturers. I want to make sure that everybody feels comfortable in our showroom. Um, listen, every, a great designer can do modern, transitional, traditional, uh, exotic, whatever you want to say. And I'm sure each, each of us have our own, you know, see how we curate our spaces. Mm -hmm. But I certainly want to make sure that when people walk into our space, what they feel first is welcomed and that they know that we're there to help them, to not be standoffish. Um, we're not, you know, some of the showrooms, we've gotten feedback, you know, in, in some of the cities and this, you know, you walk in, I know I've walked into some of them and nobody looks at you, nobody right. addresses you. Um, would you like a water? Would you like a coffee? Um, so, you know, and it's also too about the product mix. So, you know, we could have a baker chair with a Braxton color, sofa. You know, I want to make sure that people understand that we have all different levels of product, that we can work with them at different levels on different projects, different budgets. Um, I just want them to feel confident that we have everything that they can, well, not everything, listen, you know, most of what that they would, they would need for their projects. And if they don't, if you don't have everything and they were asking you for something, I bet you, I just have this feeling like you'd look into it. Um, yeah. Yes, or we just buy it at like no margin to ourselves. We're like, we'll handle it for you. We'll just <laughs> right. do it as an accommodation. And we right. do that, we do it all of the time. Because just going back to something you said about why would somebody say, well, I can order that directly. You know, you can order from any of our showrooms and order from 20 different vendors and have one order. So one order to follow up on um, versus 20 different phone calls. And I always say to designers, time is money. So if you'd rather be spending time following up and making sure that your fabric got from point A to point B, that the leg, you know, came off the Johnson truck and it wasn't cracked, you know, that's fine. But if you want to free up your time so that you're prospecting, so you're spending that time with your clients, let us do the schlock. <laughs> I, I'm happy. I I love schlock. I'm very good at it. You help. Do you work with editors very too? Good at it. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, good, <laughs> Melissa. I'm gonna I'm gonna change change and uh, the question up a little bit because I just um, I bet you wear many many hats and I'd love to know what a typical day is like for you. Okay, the school bus leaves at um, <laughs> ten to seven. <laughs> Um, and then, you know, work begins. I mean, work really is when you're in your own business, um, work is 24 hours a day. You know, there's constant emails and 
cell phones and all of the different means of communication that we, we all have now, you can't help it. Mm -hmm. um, you'd like to say at some point you put your phone down and you don't look at it. I and can't. Not in my personality. I'm sorry. Now you're having dinner with your clients at home, so. <laughs> <laughs> And you answer emails because I, I know some of the designers are working on projects, you know, later. And if I'm not, if it's not inappropriate, if I have the moment, I'm happy to answer the questions and answer the emails when I can. Um, I, I don't feel, you know, put upon or invaded into my space. It, it's, it's that kind of industry. We all, it, the demands are high. So we try and service the need. Um, but, you know, then the showroom um, accounting comes in at eight in the morning. Um, so I start to get phone calls from them about those kind of operational things very early in the morning. And mm -hmm. then the day goes at 10 o'clock we open and we start seeing designers coming into the space, um, delivery questions, you know, doing paperwork. Um, and there's, I, I think going back to what Alexis said, vibe in the space is really important. Um, I, I remember one day, it's back like what the person said about Schwartz, a, a designer sitting in the showroom, we happen to be very crowded at the moment, and she sits back and she puts her arm and she's like relaxing and she goes, Melissa, I just love it here. <laughs> and everybody laughed, but it, it was a sincere statement. You know, that's what I, I want people to feel welcome. I want them to be feel comfortable staying here and answering their emails, even after they've finished their research. You know, have mm -hmm. a cappuccino, relax, make it your office. Because, if, you know, we all know designers, they are independent. They mm -hmm. very often, their offices are within their home. It's nice to be away from that mm -hmm. and have people to bounce ideas off of. How do you like these two fabrics together? Do you feel this wallpaper is interesting with it? Um, that's what we're here for. Um, but mm -hmm. I want it to be always a very positive environment. You know, my own internal office has a glass window um, out to the showroom, you know, and, and a glass door. And I, I want everybody to, to wave and say hello. Um, and, you know, and, and, you know, it's life. Business doesn't always have, um, it's not always 100% fun. Mm -hmm. um, so they'll, they'll see my face and they'll, they'll like mouth to me through the window. Bad day. Um, but <laughs> they're, they're my friends and they make me feel better too. Um, mm -hmm. So that's the vibe I want here. Yeah, no, it's, it's it all sounds very good. Um, <laughs> so what is, I mean, business feels good. You know, your spaces seem like you, I just want to visit you all. What are, what's one of the biggest challenges that you you have right now with business and how getting are you work? Um, getting back to work mm -hmm. is, is a challenge because everything is, while all of the restrictions, um, we're all working hard, you know, sending out samples, but it takes an order that could normally happen within a 24 hour period from finding the product to having the sample in your hand and getting the approval from your client could happen in 24 hours. In this environment, getting the factory to send a sample, to send to the designer, which then sends it to the client, all of a sudden this order takes three weeks to process. Um, mm -hmm. That's a big difference. Um, those are the difficulties that we're having to work through given the current envi you know, business environment. Mm -hmm. Time. Yeah, I think there's there's the logistical, of course, we're all in areas, I don't know if everybody who's on this chat is from the Northeast or the West Coast, but we're all still, you know, oh, have to be right closed. Um, but for New Jersey and Connecticut, it, it's interesting having two businesses in two different states, um, which you think of the tri-state, you think of it as kind of one area, but, you know, Connecticut is opening up before New Jersey. So, I mean, and, and thankfully, we've already had designers who have, are calling us and texting us and want to come in and want to have appointments. And we've been lucky enough that we've been able to accommodate them. Um, so, it's, and I always say, too, for everyone, it's sort of like dipping our toe in because we're all, go we're all learning as we go. Thank God nobody's been through anything quite like this before. Um, and hopefully, we won't ever soon again. So we're all figuring it out. Um, 
you know, and, and I was laughing because the other day I had an appointment with a designer and her client. And then uh, one of my teammates would had an appointment two hours later and I thought there'd be enough time. And I was still working when she came in and I was freaking out. I'm like, oh my God, you know, we're four people now in here. Is this going to be too much? Is there a dance between? And guess what? We all had our masks on and we were all you know, laughing because we couldn't breathe under our masks because we were laughing. Your glasses and, on. Yeah, and my glasses are fogging <laughs> up and I'm like, I'm a mess. But you know what? We worked through it and obviously there's the psychological effect and I, and I said this before, the number one thing for me is making sure all of our team feel safe and secure and, you know, because they're the people who have, who, who have created this incredible showroom experience um, for us. So when they feel comfortable, you know, and different people are going to feel differently, right? So um, I've said to everyone, we have to just remember, we can't judge. People are going to have different reactions. You know, this is the whole psychology behind it. And, you know, there are some clients who we're going to have to go a little above and beyond too. And I mean, I have a chair in my car that I brought from Connecticut that I'm going to have to bring to the designer to drop off to have her clients that are tush in the dining chair, you know, so we are all doing things that, you know, can hopefully, if we can all partner together and everyone's kind of thinking outside the box and doing, you know, we can start to make those steps forward or inward. I want to, um, we have a lot of questions and um, we've got 15 more minutes. So I want to start to fire off some questions and I'm going to just randomly shoes or you know you can if, if you feel very strongly so one of the questions is what's the difference between a buying group and a trade showroom who would like to take that i think all of us would okay <laughs> um well Jeannie, we haven't heard from you recently <laughs> do you want to take it okay i'll take it okay so um so trade showroom you know we've got a brick and mortar footprint where we've got uh samples on the floor. You know, we've got a staff to deal with the, the issues that come up. There's one central place where all those orders come in, they're processed and, and they're taken care of through, through our showroom. Um, uh, with the buying group, from what I understand, um, they, it's kind of, um, you know, one person kind of has organized it. Designers buy into it. Uh, buy into a membership and there are account holders around the country that um, that may not necessarily have a brick and mortar showroom they may run they may run the business out of their house and I guess they pull all those orders many of these people people are designers um, um, designers from home um, and they pull those orders and um, you know they uh, uh, provide pricing and then place the orders for those designs. To jump in with Jeannie too, I think the number one difference is relationship. The buying groups don't have the relationships with the manufacturers. So what happens is to Je what Jeannie was saying, as they're spread out, they're doing that so that they're hitting minimums to be able to get a stock and dealer price. So you can purchase maybe a chair at a stock and dealer price. So what happens when that chair comes in and it's damaged? Who, who, who is handling everything? And if that person's out of Iowa and your project's in Long Island, who are your boots on the ground? Who is going in there when something gets ripped? There's not the resource. Who is then calling the manufacturer? Because, I mean, as we, this has been a, a discussion point for many years, the buying group. It's not, it's not anything new. Um, it's just kind of keeps transitioning, especially with social media. But most of them, manufacturers, the larger ones that we all deal with, they're not interested in creating the relationships with these buying groups because those buying groups are not investing in their products. They're not investing in the training. Um, I send my staff down to Hickory Chair University, University to lead to learn about these products. Um, we're partnering with our vendors so that we can then partner with our clients. Um, buying groups don't provide that kind of support for, for each, each other's business. Now, if you're a designer who doesn't need any support and never has any mistakes and can go along and build their business and do it perfectly, then a buying group's for you. Yeah. Okay. And we all, you know, 
but that's, you know, we all know that that's really not reality. It's okay. not, it's not reality. And to speak to further to what Alexis was saying, when something comes in and it is damaged, you very often need factory support and a local sales representative to make some type of an inspection. Well, the, if your product is being distributed out of Iowa, the Iowa rep who didn't, you know, isn't going to go to your state to go mm -hmm. inspect. And the other rep from that state isn't going because they didn't, it's not their client. You know, so it, it's very complicated. Good point. Okay. All right. Well, we, we gave some, we gave insight and yes, it is, a, it has been going on the discussion for a while, but it's, it's, um, people are still curious. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Melissa, I, I'd like to know, um, here's a question. Why would you choose to sell to designers only and not the general public? Um, I think that years ago when I was, um, when I opened the final touch, the reason I did it is because there was no local showroom, multi-line showroom on Long Island and designers need it, needed it. You know, you need to be able to have a place where you can go to have all the fabric samples, all of the wood finish samples, um, a sofa from a particular vendor to have your client understand the difference between a uh, spring down cushion and a cushion with just poly and Dacron. Um, those kind of things you need to touch Educated and feel. Space. Correct. Right, but but why have, have you in this, you know, climate or, you know, um, let's see, you opened, you opened in 2000, right? The showroom. Right. So you've been through a, a recession already and, you yes. know, and here you are. Um, but have you ever, you know, did you ever entertain, like, maybe I'll open to retail? No, the trade needs us. The trade the, needs you, keep it. Trade I needs think us. It's a different environment and it's a different sale. Um, they're my people and I want to take care of them. I think, too, there are certain people who do it with, in, who can do retail and trade and do it with integrity. Jeannie and I were talking and and mm -hmm. certainly Deanie is somebody who does it with utmost integrity for her clients and keeps it very separate, but it's very difficult to do. Um, I can really count maybe on my one people who I know that do it very successfully. And I think that that's terrific. I knew for me and how my brain works and how I, you know, looked at the business. I mean, I, I as you mentioned, we were, were in business for about 78 years and we are retail for about 55. And so when my mother transitioned to trade, she looked at that business when we closed the retail and found that her relationships were with designers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as, when I came into it, um, we were already strictly only trade. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really the only way we saw that we could best use our energy and our efforts for us again and not feel that we were you know, somebody was coming in off the street and we couldn't protect our client, the designer. Again, right. there, are, there are people who do it well. Just for well, us, we couldn't. It, it that does person is sitting above <laughs> you in my, in my screen. So Jeannie, how, how do you do it well? Uh, it is tricky. It really is. And, um, you know, my loyalty is with the designers because they bring in constant business. Um, you know, we see the quality of what we sell is very high. So if we sell something to a retail client, they may not be back for 20 years, whereas a designer comes back project after project. Um, we get a retail client who's constantly trying to, um, you know, say, well, what's the discount? Uh, you know, I'm working with a designer. All of those transactions, anything has to go through the designer. So the designer can decide how they're going to, you know, if they're going to share any of their discount um, with, with their client. And we've lost many retail sales because of that, but mm -hmm. that's what you have to do. Um, and if, if we could, we probably would be just trade only, but I know that a lot of the manufacturers, you know, that we work with, they do want a brick and mortar location in this area because there's no one here that, um, you know, there is one large retail uh, showroom, but uh, it's very, it's very, 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 very traditional. Um, and we're anything but that. So it's a, t a totally different product. <laughs> right. Um, Alexis, uh, when we were emailing, you said you love to, um, you know, you love when a new designer comes in. 
and, and kind of setting them up. So one of the questions is, what does it take to get set up in your showrooms, in a showroom like yours? Like mm -hmm. somebody comes in, what happens? So somebody comes in and basically we, we ask them for their resale certificate and for their business information. We set them up in our system. Um, we try to ask new people to come in uh, with an appointment only so that we can devote the time to really spend with them, to walk them through our showroom um, and our process um, and how we work because everybody works a little bit differently and how we feel you know, we can best suit their needs. And it also gives us time to learn about their business, uh, which I think is equally important. I like to be able to make sure that we spend time figuring out, you know, what is it that you're looking for a showroom? I want to make sure that we're hitting those parameters. But, you know, we do qualify people. Um, you have to have a resale. You have to have a business. Mm -hmm. um, I know people have asked me, oh, I don't have a website. I don't, that's okay. That's okay. I mean, now it's, you know, funny, mostly everybody does or they have now a social media presence, but um, we certainly do qualify uh, because it's, I mean, it happens. Listen, I'm sure we've all had the people come in. My husband's a builder. I'm a designer, <laughs> right. uh, sure. blah, 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 you know, and it, great, you know, and, and listen, we're happy to have anybody walk around our showroom and experience it. Again, in, in Connecticut, it's different. We're in a very industrial area. So really there's no walk-in traffic. In Metuchen in New Jersey, we're like in a little town, you know, like the kids hopefully soon they'll be walk back and forth, you know, in, in our parking lot. Mm -hmm. So we have, we do get some people coming in off of the street, especially in New Jersey, because they also recognize the name and they come in. My, my parents got their first, bedroom set from your grandfather you know nice. blah, blah, blah. your aunt and your mother sold me my kitchen set you, wow. you know and it's nice it's awesome it'd be fun if you had like the, Sh the schwartz like attic where you kept all the furniture from 70 years ago can you imagine that would be i mean oh. not whatever didn't oh. sell you know so you'd have a nice antique well space. that's like I, I i kind of say that of my home because it's kind of the land of misfit furniture like oh that's those lamps didn't come on correctly. I'm like, oh, I'll take them to my house. <laughs> I, I, I want um, So, okay. So I'm sure you all qualify new, new people. Yes. This process. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I want to just take it to the brand level because, you know, working with brands, those are other relationships that you, you spend a lot of time establishing. And one of the questions was, what is something that a vendor or a rep can do right now to, to help you during this time? I mean, you, like I, I look at you and I think, I, these ladies don't need help, but is there anything that your your vendors or your reps can do right now? Uh, I'll take it unless anybody... Go, Melissa. Uh, I think that the reps have been incredibly supportive and mm -hmm. are working very hard to make sure that we have all of the up-to-date information about how the factories are operating, when they're opening, what departments are... You know, there's been staged openings where the vendor has opened certain departments and then the next week more and the next week more. Um, but I think they've been terrific. It's important that um, to send samples, you know, in a timely fashion, and they have been supporting us. I really have no complaints at all about any of the responses from the factories across the country. Mm -hmm. I agree. One thing that we're working on, too, is bringing High Point to your living room and making sure that we're working with our vendors to bring different Zoom presentations and putting together a calendar. I, I will say that in the beginning weeks, I really kind of shied away from that because it was such a visceral thing that we were all going through. And I knew I was opening up my emails and I was like, if I get invited to one Zoom presentation. So, I, you know, instead what I did was I offered meditation. I brought in a friend of mine who had a meditation business locally in my town. And I thought I'd love to support her. I'd love to offer meditation to my clients and to my staff. Um, so I really kind of focused on more of the person in terms, you know, instead of saying, I've got 17 different Zooms you can log into, but we are working in that direction so that we can put things together. But I agree with Melissa. I think all of the reps have really gone out of the way and thought out of the box as well. And the manufacturers. Je Jeannie, anything to add to that? Same. They've, you know, they've, they've been very communicative. I mean, I've had reps who've dropped things off on my front porch. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, so they they have been, and I and I expect them to continue to do so as well. Mm -hmm. Or right now, 
the first day that we can officially open here, but curbside only. I mean, we take in appointments though. So I, we're not. We I think my UPS guy is probably wondering what the heck is going on. <laughs> yeah. <Because> yeah. <laughs> the ship is coming to my house. Like I, I've had wallpaper shipped to my home. Mm -hmm. So that if the job site's open, I bring it there as yep. opposed to just getting lost, you know, here in the building. I mean, my landlord has been receiving in the building, but then it just sits here. At least if it's coming to my home and I can help facilitate um, the time and the delivery, I will. So, so I know we are, we are we're coming up on three. It is actually three. And I have gotten, I've gotten messages for people going, will it be recorded? And I believe, yes, it will be recorded. So you sign and you registered, that information mm -hmm. will be sent out to you. Um, I think this, we need a part two. Because we're just getting going. Continue so. the conversation. <laughs> I yes, and and I think I wish we had an after hours format. But um, so let's keep um, again, Melissa, Alexis, Jeannie. Thank you. Um, thank I have a you. question. Actually, thank you. you. Work with like most of your clients are in your area, or what? You know, are there anybody outside your area um, that you work with? Like Jeannie, do you? I may be a little bit different than everybody else because um, because I work with designers around the country. I you know I lead the High Point Market Insiders Tour, and because of that, I have really connected with designers who may not want to handle all that paperwork on their own. You know, I'll take them to the showrooms. I'll take them to showrooms that um, offer some level of customization. Again, that's my big shtick with, uh, or not my shtick, but you know that's what I I try to. Um, um, uh, really dig into designers that, hey, you guys are complaining about your client shopping you. Well, you know, these are some options for you. You can't be shopped this way. Mm -hmm. So really to survive as a designer, it's a good idea to, you know, implement implement or, or use uh, customized items in your in your product so I've connected with those uh, designers and then um, you know I'm a designer as well so I do belong to um, a, a number of Facebook groups so and people know that we have a trade showroom so they're constantly asking me for advice and you know where can they purchase this or that so I'll help those those designers out well as well and Alexis and Melissa, mm -hmm. do you work outside of, you You know, how far outside of your communities? So, I, I mean, be, being between, you know, Connecticut and New Jersey, we certainly work within the, the tri-state area, but we work, we do as well. We work with designers all over the country. Um, a lot of times it starts with people just moving. And, you know, we have somebody who we work with who now lives in L.A. and, you know, wanted to work with the local resource, but when she got there, really wanted our service um, and wanted to keep our relationship. Um, but we do, we work with designers, again, through social media. We've, we've made some great contacts. And interestingly, I, I don't know if it's um, a trend, but we are getting a lot of inquiries out of the Boston area. I don't know if it's being in Stanford. If, you know, I think too, it'll be interesting design centers, um, you know, they've been somewhat quiet, you know, there's, mm -hmm. a, that's a whole other conversation. Yeah. Um, but we've been getting a lot of inquiries. So w again, we work with people all over. And well, I think traditional showrooms, you know, really do have to think outside the box and they're, they're, they're constantly having to pivot to, you know, um, you know, to, to cater to a younger audience as well. So it's not like it, it like it used to be. <laughs> you know, the industry, you know, it, it does lend itself when you make connections outside of your area that you can do business in very often with things across the country. Um, mm -hmm. And it does and develop relationships. You meet one person um, mm -hmm. in Florida and then that person has a friend in New Orleans, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And, and just, and after this, we're going to, I'm going to wrap it up, but you were saying, um, Melissa, in our email that your, your online um, capacity to order online when designers are working, you know, that's an area that's getting more mm -hmm. built up too. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it enables really anybody to reach out to you. So I want, I want to thank you for your time and for sharing your thoughts. Thank and you for having us. On. For the people that came on, thank you for 
choosing to hang out with us this afternoon to Aspire Design and Home. Thanks for asking me to host this panel. I, th these women are awesome. And, um, and if you're not um, subscribed to Designers Today magazine and you're in the trade, in, in the design trade, please go to our website and subscribe. So thank Thanks, you all. Have thank, a great you. thank you. Happy Friday. And, uh, good luck opening. Thank you. Know? you. <laughs> okay. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.